I want to uh, say this, welcome to Game Fair, welcome all of the candidates to Game Fair, uh, but uh, I think we should be very proud of the fact that uh, uh, the, the leading candidates for, to be leader of our state have chosen to be here. There's lots of places they could be, but I think it says a lot about us and the fact that you have... <laughs> We have discovered that uh, the outdoor lifestyle is important to us and we're making that impact on our leaders to pay attention to the things that make Minnesota great outdoor wise and value. So no more need to be said. I'm privileged also to have as my colleague today uh, and one of the sponsors of this, uh, by the way, the editor of Outdoor News, Rob Driesland. Rob? Thanks, Ron. Thank you very much, everyone, for turning out. A great crowd. I want to just cite some of the sponsors that brought this together. Uh, Gary Leaf from Sportsman's for Change. Uh, I think probably first called me and said, let's try to put this together. He's been doing it for a number of years. Gary couldn't make it today. Ron Husvedt is here. Ron, can you raise your hand? Where is he? There he is, right in front. Ron, uh, Ron's the guy that's been working his tail off, getting this all set up, getting the microphones together, you know, coordinating everything. So thank you very much, Ron. Towards the end, we're hoping that we can, if, if the crowd has some questions that we don't get to, raise your hand periodically during the forum and Ron will bring you a pad of paper. You can write down a question and we'll fil he'll filter them through, through Ron and I. Uh, and we'll try to include some of those at the end. Uh, I also want to thank Chuck Delaney. Chuck's been great for years hosting this big crowd. Uh, you know, good friend of, of the outdoors. He's donated a lot of money to the Build a Wildlife Area effort over the years. So I want to thank him. <laughs> And with that, why don't I introduce the candidates? Uh, starting off, uh, immediately to my left, we've got uh, US, former U.S. Senator Mark Dayton. He's, uh, his varied background, he started off as a teacher, I believe, in your early days. Uh, he was a legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Walter Mondale. Was that in the 70s, I presume? Back, back in those days. He also served as the minister... Before, before you were born. Uh, uh, well, not quite. You're, you're getting there. But. Also served as Minnesota State Auditor from 91 to 95. He was a U.S. Senator from Minnesota from 2001 to 2007. And he played a little college hockey, I understand. Good. All right, there you go. To his immediate left, we've got Linda Eno representing the Resource Party. And I think I made it clear Mark Dayton represents the DFL. I think we all know that. Uh, Linda, of, is, uh, she's a co-owner with her husband Bill of Twin Pines Resort on the uh, west shore of Lake Mille Lac. She is a mother of four. We were talking before him. Her, her, old, her youngest son, Mark, helped me with the bait bucket on a launch. He was a little kid, and I understand he's in his first year of college now. So congratulations to Mark. Uh, she's a promoter of all things Mille Lac, and she's been an activist for many years on behalf of private citizens monitoring tribal treaty claims around the state. So thank you, Linda. We've got a Republican candidate, Tom Emmer. He's an attorney and legislator, a member of the Minnesota House of Representatives, representing District 19B. That includes uh, portions of Wright and Hennepin counties. Also a former college hockey player and judging from all the Emmer jerseys, uh, still a fan. I've challenged the senator to his showdown, by the way, so hopefully we'll get that done. Probably not today I, with this heat, I don't think. Uh, and finally, we've got uh, from the Independence Party, Mr. Tom Horner. Uh, Horner served as U.S. Senator Dave Durenberger's press secretary and chief of staff. He's a co-founder of a public relations firm and has also served as an adjunct professor at the University of St. Thomas. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Horner. And when they have the shootout, I'll referee. There you <laughs> go. There you go. I would just like to reiterate uh, something uh, Ron said. Let's have A, brevity, I think, in our comments so we can get through. There's a lot of topics to talk about. And, and B, let's all be courteous, both the crowd and the candidates. We all saw Almanac last night, guys, and it sounded like it got a little warm. So let's try to keep it... Uh, Cool down a little bit today on these outdoor topics. Are we ready to begin, Rob? All right. We're going to take turns asking some questions here, but let's find out first from each of you. In 90 seconds or less, please provide a brief description of your life as it relates to the outdoors and conservation issues. Tell us why sportsmen and women should support you. 
Uh, let's just start at the very end there. Tom Horner. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks everyone to, to coming out. A great opportunity for us to discuss issues that I think really go to the core of what makes Minnesota a great state. Thanks to all the sponsors and, and the, the hosts for having us here. You know, I grew up in a family where my, my dad, some of you may remember, Jack Horner, one of the, the first um, TV sports celebrities, where sports and outdoors always have been part of my life, where we've always made an investment in understanding the value of, of sports, of outdoors, of what it means to, to be a Minnesotan, to enjoy that part of our life. In my professional and community service career, I've carried that forward. I had the opportunity to work for Dave Dernberger. Dave was one of the, the, the great champions of our park and trail system in, in Minnesota, and I picked up that kind of legacy from his mentoring and have carried that, that forward. So I believe strongly that for Minnesota to be a great state, we need to make these kinds of investments in, in um, uh, the, the quality of our water, in our wildlife habitat, and our land management, all of those kinds of assets that go to the kind of state that we want to live in. All right. Hey, that's, yeah, there's 30 seconds left. Very Bre good. Bre brevity is my middle hey, name. It's Ron. fine if you go short. Yeah. 90 seconds, Mr. Ammer. Uh, this is something that we just don't talk about in my family. This was passed down from my grandfather to my father to me and now to our kids. Jackie and I have seven kids, six boys and a daughter. And if you want to know how interested we are, I have three older boys that just got back from Lake of the Woods. Jack got shut out. Bob and uh, Tripp both had uh, walleyes that they could brag about. Our daughter Katie just got back from gun camp this week. She spent a week shooting every gun that is out there. In fact, I asked her this morning, she said, I can't give you all the numbers. I don't remember what all the numbers are. Although she did take a scope, Ron, in the, uh, in the face with a 30-odd six, and she still looks pretty good. This is uh, something more than, than uh, just talking about. This is our lifestyle. I told you, my dad used to take me out to the uh, river bottoms. So you, we know where Valley Fair is today. We used to hunt pheasants there and ducks on the river bottoms. Uh, I did it as a kid. I did it in college. When I was in Alaska, I actually took the first half of my last year in college and put all my classes on Tuesday and Thursday. And yes, I will talk about this. So we could hunt Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a little Saturday, and a lot on Sunday in the fall. Uh, this is something we do, and as a parent, Ron, it's about making sure that this tradition can be passed on to further generations, including mine. As a parent raising seven kids, we know how expensive it is. It's about access and making it cost effective so that we can continue to enjoy all the great hunting and fishing and protect the natural resources that are Minnesota. All right, very good. Uh, Linda, you're next. Thanks, everybody, for coming, and thanks for recognizing the resource party. I think as you find the media around um, leaves out a few of the smaller parties. Uh, I'd like to say 16 years ago, my husband and I uh, bought Twin Pines Resort on the west side of Mille Lacs Lake, following the American dream, and in Minnesota, really following the American dream, thinking you're going to fish and, uh, and make this your lifestyle, um, only to be thrown in the midst of the treaty management situation. So all of a sudden, the American dream turned into an American nightmare. I have watched, I say, your resources and my livelihood and my children's future being negotiated away and mismanaged and abused. When, when my fishermen and all, when all of, you, all of Minnesota's fishermen go out on a lake and they're told, oh, you really don't need to keep a fish, you know, catching and releasing is okay. Isn't a walleye meal of Minnesota tradition? How dare the media and people say, you know what, it's okay to have a two inch slot limit. And then when the, the management is not biological, it's really political, there's a problem. And that's what propelled me into this position and, and the politics. And I've worked pretty hard thinking grassroots might work. And then all of a sudden, being kind of a naive American citizen, you realize it's not grassroots, it's money and power that's running things at the Capitol. And it's about time that the, the our elected officials start to listen to the constituents and what the people want and not the money and power. And All that's right, what right. I would say. Very good. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. And last, certainly not least, Mr. Dayton. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, I grew up uh, hunting and fishing. I went uh, down to Heron Lake and near Wyndham with my father and my brother. Uh, started out in a duck blind with uh, newspapers wrapped around my legs as a wind block and a, a BB gun at about age six. And, I didn't hit many ducks with a BB gun, I must confess, but I did a lot better when I graduated up to a 12-gauge shotgun. Uh, 
been fishing all my life up on Lake Vermilion uh, with my grandfather's cabin. And I, you know, if, I just want uh, everyone to know that if I'm a governor, the sportsmen and women of this state are going to have a friend in the governor's office. Uh, I will veto any legislative attempts to usurp the authority of the Lazard Sam's Council. Uh, I'll work closely with the hunting, uh, angling, and conservation groups to select a strong supporter of your interests as the commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources. I will appoint members to the Lazard Sam's Council who represent all of Minnesota geographically. I think it's ridiculous that there is not a single member of the Lazard Sam's Council in the northern 200 miles of the state of Minnesota. And I will veto any legislative attempt, such as Representative Emmer supported last year, co-sponsored, in fact, to repeal the Legacy Amendment, which was passed by a vote of almost 60% of the Minnesotans in 2008 who voted on that amendment as an overwhelming support. And I will say to the legislators, uh, starting with the uh, attempts like Representative Embers to repeal that legislation, that government interference in the will of the people will not be tolerated if I'm governor. Thank you, Mr. Dayton. Um, well, we could, I guess. Uh, why, why don't we give uh, Representative, Representative Emmer, that was our second question, why don't we just jump right to that one. Representative Emmer, why didn't you support the Legacy Amendment and you, your name is also on a bill to uh, repeal the amendment? Do you want to state your case? Absolutely, and I talked about it last year when we were here and I'll talk about it in the future. Uh, we don't agree on everything and I didn't agree on putting the tax into, uh, into our Constitution. That discussion is over. The one assurance I would make everybody in this room is that if I'm governor of this state, we're not going backwards, we're going forwards. And you know what? You gotta make sure that these uh, funds, uh, Senator, are being used for the original intent. We gotta make sure that those funds are going to wildlife, fish and hunting habitat, not to dog parts in Minneapolis. And we gotta make sure that we stand up to the, uh, the animal rights extremists that are trying to put puppy, our, our great kennels out of business, our dog breeders, that's what the sportsmen need. That's what all of us need. Not looking backwards, looking forwards. And folks, that discussion is over. That uh, fight is over. We are not going to repeal the legacy amendment. We didn't have to agree with it. And by the way, uh, Senator Dayton, since you brought it up, you weren't there. One of the things that was missing, Ron, and, and you guys will remember, when the uh, legislation was first pushed through the, uh, through the legislature, we didn't have the mechanics for the Lassard Council, the Lassard Sam's Council. So as a responsible policymaker, not only do you have problems with a constitutional issue, but that's gone now. The other issue is how's the Lassard Sam's Council going to work? And I'll tell you what. So far, I've been impressed with how it's, it's working, but I think we need to do a lot more to impress upon people that are on that, uh, working with hunting and fishing groups to advance more productive hunting and fishing habitat, not dog parks in Minneapolis. I thank you. I have, I have one little follow-up, uh, uh, Mr. Amber, uh, just because uh, in my hand here is a bill to uh, eliminate the Constitutional Amendment and has your name on it. Does that's that right. mean you're taking your name off of it? That's, that's right. That's, part of that was because we're just seeing how the Lassard Sam's Council is working. And I've got to tell everybody in the room, I'm scared to death of people like Gene Wagenius in Minneapolis taking away my kids' right to hunt and fish in the future. And I was worried about the mechanics of the Lassard Sam's Council not working the way it was intended. You know what? We've seen it so far. We just need to have a governor that will put people on that council that will honor the original intent. And yes, my name will be on. You want to tear it up? Sure. So, but, so that's why you tried to repeal it in 2009 was because of your concerns about the Lassard Council? Yeah, that's part of it. I mean, we have to see how this is working. And now you don't go backwards. We're going to leave it. And we're going to make sure that we appoint people to the council that will honor the original intent and make sure the money goes where it's intended to produce productive wildlife uh, hunting and fishing habitat. Senator Dayton, a quick retort. Well, I, you know, I worked for uh, Senator Mondale back when he was a senator. His father was a minister. And uh, Fritz said his father used to tell him the only trouble with deathbed conversions is they seldom last if the patient recovers. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, Representative Embers had a conversion on this uh, because we do need this amendment and it should be hands off the legislature. I will support members of the Lazard Sam's Council who will make decisions that represent the will of the people, that represent the language of that amendment as the people of Minnesota voted on it. And I will veto any attempt by the legislature to interfere with that, to usurp the authority of the Lazard Council. That's been my consistent position. I supported that amendment as a private citizen. I contributed to the vote yes 
uh, in contrast to Representative Emmer, it's a fundamental difference between us. I supported that amendment. I've always supported that amendment. I will always support that amendment. And I will say it's the will of the people and the Lazard Sam's Council's word ought to be the authority on where that money is spent. But you know what, okay, Senator, if we're going to talk America. about more we let them hunt fun too. topics like this. Shoreline development has been in well, the news. Can, 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 I mean, can I just take one, one quick re response? And, and I don't want to do, keep doing the back and forth. But look, the issue is we do have to go forward. And part of that legacy amendment is that it is new money. It's not money intended to replace the funds that we're already putting into environment, into land management, into habitat protection. And that's the issue. And we're not going to do that if we keep cutting, if we have simplistic solutions, if we don't have a commitment going forward to make sure that we are funding the, the uh, wild water quality, land management, conservation officers, habitat protection and development. It is also the money going forward. It is the commitment to the full text of the, the amendment, not just to one narrow slice of it. And that's going to take leadership. That's going to take foresight. That's going to take a commitment to outdoors. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to pitch this next question. You can, you can start, uh, Mr. Horner, with, with uh, this next topic, which is shoreline development. Been in the news a lot this year. The Star Tribune, Tom Mearsman, did a fine story about shoreline development in the Brainerd Lakes area. This past Wednesday, the governor of Minnesota took several years of work that had gone into some new shoreline development uh, plans for the state and basically rejected them. Bottom line, that means you folks, uh, the, the next governor or the next legislature is going to have to tackle this topic. Um, a lot of people feeling that the shoreline rules we have were developed for a time when Minnesota had a few small cabins on a few lakes. Now we've got big lake homes. Uh, is it time to uh, address this? Would your administration be satisfied with status quo uh, or support some new regulations establishing size limits, maybe on docks, uh, revised requirements for buildings, development, sewage systems along our state lakes. Uh, I'll let you tackle it first, Mr. Horner. A a absolutely, and that's a great example of how we need to keep moving forward, how we need a government that understands its role. Doesn't grow too big, we do need to, to rein it in, but we also need a government that does the responsible things and water quality. It's not just shoreline protection, it is water quality in Minnesota. We really do need to focus on that. So my disappointment was that not just the governor vetoed the, the, the or rejected the the proposals, but that he's made no effort to figure out how can we work with local governments to have state-of-the-art standards, to have enforcement of ordinances that are going to protect the water quality, not just with docks, but with the, the shoreline protection. Where do we, and how do we invest, how do we have the resources to invest through CRP and other mechanisms in making sure that we have the easements around the, 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 the creeks, the waterways, the drainage dishes, ditches to protect the, the, the water quality? How do we make sure that that on, on all of these issues, we are saying that water quality is, is important. And one of the things, frankly, that did disappoint me last week in Farm Fest is when Representative Emmer said that he was going to take all environmental regulations that touch agriculture, well, what environmental regulation doesn't touch agriculture, and put them under the Department of Agriculture. That's absolutely the wrong way to go. I mean, what do you say then to the forest products industry? What do you say to Ducks Unlimited? What do you say to the Sierra Club? What do you say to those who care about water quality? quality, we need a governor who's going to say the same thing to every audience. And the thing we need to say to Minnesota audiences is that our lakes, our rivers, our waterways are a critical asset. We need to protect them. That's going to take a smart government investment in the kinds of things that really do make a difference. Uh, Representative Emmer, uh, he, he's kind of still a thunder there. We were going to ask about the ag comment. Uh, would you like to, I guess, first respond on the shoreline point sure. and then, and then sure. address his, uh, his agricultural statement there? Well, ab actually, let's start with this. First, there is no such thing as smart government. It does not exist. Government is not a person. It's about people making decisions that impact people. So when we talk about good government, smart government, we're talking about us. When you talk about uh, the shoreline regulations uh, and protecting our shoreline, you know what, I, I don't agree with Governor Pauline on everything. I think that's pretty well known if you look at the history. But when it comes to this, he did the right thing. Uh, we should give more local control. The one size fits all has been the problem coming from the politicians in St. Paul for far too long. You can't have a one size fits all. There has to be more local control. The future is not talking in big terms about smart government and the rest. The future is actually doing it. Giving local control and putting in place a basic set of standards that the local authorities can not only apply and make sure that there's compliance, 
but then review every 10 years to make sure what is, is appropriate in their county is working in their county. That's the future. And then this bit about the uh, agriculture, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Uh, what I talked about down at Farm Fest and John, where'd you go? You asked me about this because there's some misinformation being floated around that somehow uh, this is going to impact sportsmen in a negative way. You know what? We should break out game and fish, not fish and wildlife, game and fish. And we should have it be about uh, habitat for hunting and fishing once again. The MPCA is frankly a problem for both the DNR and for the Department of Agriculture. And what I said to the folks at the Farm Fest last week was when Farmers are getting letters from this organization called the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that says, you got to put gutters on your barn because of the water runoff. That thing has gone too far. It's working against agriculture, and what we talked about was any regulatory rulemaking authority should go within the Department of Agriculture so that, and by the way, nobody up here and nobody out there has the market cornered on wanting clean water, clean air, and protecting our natural resources. It's ultimately what we all want. So let's not point the fingers at each other. Let's point the fingers straight ahead. This was about making sure that the pollution control rules work with farmers so that we can all recognize the, the goals that we have. Same thing should be happening when we talk about the DNR. This is a much longer answer about revamping, which the DNR needs a lot of work. But one of the things that you have to do is make sure that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the environmental rules and regulations are working with sportsmen and in the interest of more productive uh, hunting and fishing habitat rather than against it. And, and just to be clear, removing game and fish from DNR and putting it under Department of Ag, is, did I hear you correct? No, no, I said you should separate it out. Okay, from not, the not under ag, a separate, no. separate agency. No, no, no. Okay. no. All right. Yeah, I we're not going to do clear. any more super uh, okay. uh, departments. That's right. been the problem. We just keep growing government bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Linda, you want to chime in on Shoreline? Um, yep, I think uh, Tom took some of my ideas immediately. I'm sorry. Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> and it just is, every lake is different in this state. You can't have people in St. Paul making one blanket blanket legislation for every lake. It's got to be back in the local governments. I live on Mille Lacs and a lot of little lakes around. It's probably the third, I, I'm not sure the statistics, but it's one of the cleanest, clearest lakes in the state. But yet there was all this hype when we were looking at our moving Highway 169, when we were looking at a sewer district. Every lake needs to be looked at individually and it needs to be up to the residents around the lake and the community that the lake is in. Excellent. Mr. Dayton? No, I, I would agree with that to a point. Certainly, it should not be one size fits all. Uh, and yet, you know, our, our public resources belong to all of us. You know, Lake Minnetonka belongs to all the people of Minnesota as a public resource and not the people only of Hennepin County or only of, uh, you know, the, the communities, say, of Minnetrista or whatever, the border upon it. So there needs to be a balance. and, and uh, since Governor Plenty has exercised his uh, prerogative as governor uh, to uh, supersede the, the process that his own commissioner was in, engaged in, the like, then, you know, I think as the paper said this morning, it's going to go to the next governor and the next commissioner. And, you know, that goes very much to the appointment of a commissioner of the Department of Natural Resource who, who, who is uh, sensitive to these different interests and these different perspectives and, and recognizes that the role of the DNR, and I've been, a, I've heard, let me say, in my 87 uh, counties and 87 days tour and over 100 community meetings around the state, probably more criticism, uh, especially in greater Minnesota, of DNR and its lack of uh, responsiveness to citizens, the lack of responsiveness to local governments, to watershed district to the chairs and, and members, the, you know, the citizens leaders of Minnesota, and I want a commissioner of DNR who's going to listen to people, who's going to listen to all the people, and is going to insist that that agency be responsive to the differences. You know, as one farmer up in Warren said to me, if we could just combine the walk the land wisdom of those of us in Warren with the expertise in St. Paul, we get a lot more done than with St. Paul trying to tell us and Warren, you know, how our resources ought to be managed. So I will appoint that kind of commissioner and we'll engage in this process again. All right. I'm going to switch to a different, maybe speed up a little bit here. Um, there have been talk about increasing uh, fishing licenses. They haven't been increased for a long time. Uh, real quickly, 
Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, your views on increasing hunting fishing license fees. Yeah, we have more fishing licenses in, uh, per capita in Minnesota than any other state. We want to be uh, careful about how we're competitive with other states. Uh, our tourism industry depends heavily on, on the summer uh, fishing uh, activities and citizens of Minnesota and the other side, you've got that money is dedicated to uh, the DNR for uh, the, the very uh, important work that they do that for, uh, improves habitat and improves uh, fishing and, and hunting around the state so it's a balance and I would get the commissioner of DNR to sit down with all the sportsmen's groups and uh, anglers and others who are in, concerned about this and we'll strike a balance. Linda? I don't think tourism can take another hit in this state and I would say leave the fishing licenses where they are and manage the lottery money a little more frugally. Okay, Mr. Rammer? God bless Linda. <laughs> I uh... <laughs> I got to tell you, I, I, Ron, I know there's a difference of opinion on this across the state. Uh, there are a lot of sportsmen who think that we should raise it. I'm going to talk to you, not as somebody who's in the tourism business, I'm going to talk to you as a parent of seven children. I want to be able to pass this on to my kids, and the more we keep raising fees, the harder it is for some families to participate in these activities. Because remember, it's not just about buying the license. It's about buying a fishing pole. It's about buying the life preserver. It's about having the access to the lake. I mean, it goes on and on, and these, these things all add up. So my answer, Ron, is no. You've got to hold the line on fees. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Horner. When, when we don't have the resources to make sure that our lakes are protected from the, the spread of zebra mussels, from milfoil, that's the most devastating thing we can do to, to our lakes. So are we going to need to raise more resources and are fees one of the things we should look at? Yes, because it's the, the future of Minnesota at stake. Okay, uh, Representative Emmer, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Uh, this, um, this past session, Representative Steve Drakowski, he offered a couple amendments, to one to the LCCMR bill, one to the Game and Fish bill, that basically codified no net gain of public land, state public lands in Minnesota. Both failed, but you supported both of those. No net gain kind of runs counter to the mission of a lot of conservation groups you see represented here. It runs counter to the build a wildlife area effort that you know, Game Fair has been the focal point for the past, the past couple years. Can you explain that vote? Should we stop acquiring WMAs in Minnesota? You want to reconcile that for us? Well, I don't think there's anything to reconcile. I think if we talk about the fact that we don't have a strategic land acquisition program in this state, we don't have a plan that's mapped out as to what we're going to do, that's a concern for somebody like me, and that's why I would support a no net gain. In the future, if we're in the governor's office, I don't think it's about no net gain legislation. I think it's about getting our DNR, working with our sportsmen's organizations to put together a strategic land acquisition management plan. And then the other half of it is about this. Take the million acres we have already and let's start making sure that our resources go into that to make it productive for uh, hunting and fishing. That's the issue. Yeah. Anybody else want to chime in? Senator Dayton or Mr. Oh, Hall, yeah, you know, no, totally. Go ahead, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, you, you know, I, I think that in this area and so many other areas, we start with, with the process. We ought to start with what is it that we want to accomplish? It is not how much we're spending, it is what for. And so we ought to start with outcomes. And I think what we want in Minnesota is, is land that, that is productive for our wildlife, where we're protecting uh, the habitats, developing new habitats, protecting the quality of, of the water. So uh, Representative Emmer is absolutely right that we ought to have a strategic plan, but it ought to be a strategic plan that says the outcome we're trying to produce is good habitat, good hunting. We want everybody to go out and be able to get their limit, and that's going to take looking at not only what are we going to acquire, but how are we going to pay local governments responsibly for, for the, the, the public land, and how are we going to manage wildlife production on our private lands, because after all, 80% of hunting, 80% of the wildlife habitat is on private land. We need a management plan that starts with the outcome of we want Minnesota to be the best state in the country for wildlife, for hunting, for, for those kinds of important outdoor activities. Senator Day. First of all, I agree with Representative Emmer that we need to manage the, the public resources we have now to, to maximize their, their quality for, for people who want to go camping and that are state parks, for people who want to go hunting and fishing on, on publicly owned lands, and that ought to be priority number one. 
Uh, I'm sympathetic to the, the concerns about public acquisition in areas especially like you take Kuchichin County, where I believe it's about 88% of, st of the county is uh, publicly owned uh, land. We're uh, in Cook County, I think it's over 90%. St. Louis County is about 75%. But I would just point out, you know, that we just had a discussion about how there should not be a one-size-fits-all uh, requirement or uh, legislation uh, from the state. And it seems to me that the, the, the bill that you you're, were discussing would impose that kind of one-size-fits-all. Uh, and I think we want more flexibility in, in management than, than that, while recognizing that there's a legitimate objective and concern that's being expressed behind that legislation. All right, very good. Just to follow up, and, and for the audience, just so you know, we are going to be, so hang with us. We're going to get to uh, some Indian resource issues. We're going to get to some other issues that I know some of you are timber wolves, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but just to follow up, and I want a yes or no from each of you, would you line item veto land acquisition dollars from the legacy amendment, LCCMR, or bonding, the RIM uh, bill? Would you line item veto land acquisition dollars? Yes or no? Um, no, I don't. I would have line item veto them. Land acquisition dollars, no. A acquisition, no. Yeah. Uh, Linda? I don't know enough about it. Okay. No. No. All right. Thank you for going on the record with that, folks. Uh, here, here's, a, here's a quick and easy one. Would you support? Will you continue to hold the governor's deer opener? We'll just go down the line. Senator Dayton. Yes, and I uh, uh, talked with Congressman Colin Peterson about a pheasant uh, hunt, uh, hunting opener uh, that he has one himself, and I'd like to initiate that. Yes. You on board, Linda? Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. All right. Governor's the duck opener. <laughs> that's that's John Ford back there. Duck there. Duck there. Duck there. Duck I agree. Duck there are no ducks. There are no ducks. What, what, what if we have right. something like a governor's son's duck opener, and, and I'll get Kevin out there, and he'll lead the charge, and get young people hey, involved in that. I'll leave my daughter out of it. I'll leave my daughter out of it. It's like a girl. And since we're on ducks, I'm very proud that in 2001, I prevented Senator Trent Lott in Mississippi and the southern states from extending their season unilaterally. And, and taking a lot more birds down there before they get back up here to Minnesota yeah. and Canada. Thank you very much. Yeah. But I would ask you, no shouting from the audience, please. <laughs> Keep it under control, Shorty. You can do that at 1 o'clock when we're done here. All right. The White Earth and Leech Lake bands have showed interest in off-reservation hunting and fishing in northern Minnesota. Would your administration oppose that and take legal action to prevent the bands from pursuing these claims? And I might also ask, um, uh, it's a two-part question. There is um, a lot of concern about the fact that the Red Lake, upper and lower, I'm no lawyer, but folks tell me it's supposed to be open to the public. It's not closed, but I don't know that, and maybe you do, but would you address those? And uh, 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 who would like to start? Tom, over there? Sure, sure. Y you know, Look, I think the, the issue likely is going to come up this fall around some of the wildlife or uh, wild rice harvest issues, and, and we're probably going to see these issues again. Um, we do need to treat this as a policy issue, not a regulatory issue. The, uh, my understanding is that the, the Beltrami County attorney has twice asked the, the Democratic Attorney General to take this up and to set policy and, and has been rejected on both occasions. So we do need to have clear policy direction on this and sort out what are the issues. But beyond that, you know, we can't keep having these kinds of confrontational issues. And so we need to figure out how, wh why isn't the governor on a regular basis sitting down with the tribes to see what we can do together? Why isn't the state working with, with Red Lake uh, and, and other bands to see how they can develop some tourism opportunities, some economic opportunities? I mean, look at the great asset that, that Red Lake is and, and what a terrific resource that could be for the tribe, for, for anglers, for outdoors people to go up there and enjoy that kind of outdoor life. There's the opportunity. It's not just in drawing a line and, and saying, I'm going to fight you over this, I'm going to fight you over that. It is in, in drawing a bigger line to saying, where do we all benefit and how can we make this work for everyone? That's the leadership the governor needs to provide. The, uh, I'll do it in reverse order, Ron. First, uh, the attorney general and the courts don't set policy. It doesn't work that way. You're talking about treaty rights. 
Uh, and we need an attorney general for once that will actually follow through and get those treaty rights determined once and for all. It's not about setting policy. It's about making sure that we know what the rights are and how they're going to be enforced. And that takes us to the next part. Uh, the governor of this state, unfortunately, when you talk about this issue, it really is a federal issue. But when you talk about it, it should be the federal, the state, and the tribes that are resolving this. Uh, we're going to need some direction from the federal government, but if we're in the governor's office, if I'm the governor of this state, what the governor of this state must do is ensure that every citizen of the state of Minnesota has the right to hunt and fish alike. You've got to protect every citizen's rights to hunt and fish. I have a feeling that I'm going to hear some of the same from Linda. Linda? <laughs> Go ahead, Linda. I guess the first thing I'd like to say when you said, when you made the comment about Red Lake, you, you, you've heard it's open. Well, you could tell that to the guy whose airplane was confiscated and the guy whose boat was confiscated. And again, being kind of naive 16 years ago when I came into this, I, I, I had no idea. How can you have two separate sets of rules for United States citizens living side by side? It's not a fishing issue. It's not a hunting issue. It's an equal rights issue. And that is, you know, people keep saying, oh, it's a federal issue. You can't keep fighting. Well, you know, I had four little kids at that time, and, and I just couldn't believe that one my little girl could stand next to her friend on the end of my dock, and one could keep a fish, and one couldn't when they were in first grade. And then how do you explain, let's celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday the next day. Um, I, I don't know how to resolve it. I feel like our state has not fought for us or put one foot forward. When I came into this issue 16 years ago and I sat in, well, maybe it was a couple years after that, Mike Hatch's office, in that attorney general's office, and I had the guy doing this. You've got a gaming compact with no expiration date. It's elementary law to have an expiration date on any contract. And the guy in the Attorney General's office is doing this. And you might say this is a fishing issue. Well, you know what? It's their money and power that we have given them through the casinos that are buying most of, I think, our political decisions. You know, it's time to break the cycle. It's time to revisit it. It's time to all be Americans, not Indians and not Irish, German, English. It's time we all move together, and I can't imagine that we have two separate sets of rules and that you've got, you know, you talk about your land acquisition. How about let's sue, like, Utah and take our land back from the federal government? How can you have a sovereign nation in the middle of a state? All of that was ripped up and the Indian, I can go on and on. But anyway, so that's how I, it, that's what kind of propelled me into it, and I've got a lot of experience with it. Senator Dave, very good. Well, how would you, uh, first, first, the White Earth and Leech Lake? Yeah. First of all, uh, the last time I looked, uh, the tribal political action committees poured over $200,000 into the DFL party to support one of my opponents in the primary and, and tried to defeat me. Because I took a stand, in this case, against uh, the monopoly control of the casino operations in Minnesota. So I would say that this is, and you know, I'm not a constitutional authority. U.S. Supreme Court ruled back on the treaties of the 1800s. Uh, the consequences of that, those decisions, even if they were constitutionally correct, are very unfortunate and very destructive for Minnesota. There should be equal rights for everybody. Everybody in this state should have the same equal rights to hunting and fishing on every parcel of property within respecting private, I said, respecting private property rights, I'll retract that, but the same equal rights of hunting and fishing uh, as anyone else. And, you know, I said from the beginning as well, you know, if my, if my brother is going out on Mille Lacs a couple weeks before me and, uh, and he's has opportunities to fish that I don't have, I'm going to be mad at my brother. Uh, so I think it's very unfortunate that you know the, this is develops the, the the ruptures and the splits and we talk about going forward and and this is one of those areas where we absolutely as a as a state and as a society of all of us need to move forward together and I, as governor I will uh, as Mr. I think you said it well Mr. Horner in, in be actively sitting down with tribal leaders and saying, what can we do to get these matters resolved so they're not destructive to, to all the citizens of the state? That's good. Yeah. yeah, let's jump back to the DNR, uh, talk a little bit about a DNR commissioner. Uh, we've had a lot of debate over what kind of person should lead a state agency. At MnDOT, we've had talk, should it be an engineer, should it be a politician? 
What qualities will you folks seek for in your uh, DNR commissioner? Will it be a politician? Will it be a resource professional? Uh, when you appoint someone to lead Department of Agri Bowser, we also maybe consider conservation when you go about those appointments. I'll, uh, we kind of start on that end. Why don't we start with Senator Dayton on this end. Uh, DNR Commissioner, what do you like and uh, what kind of person do you like and, and how do you feel about commissioners in general? I want a professional. I want someone who's going to be an active outdoor sports hunter, fisher, man or woman himself or herself. Someone who, who, who is indigenous to Minnesota, who understands how the DNR is the agency that affects more people in Minnesota more directly in their lives than probably any other agency of state government. Someone who will enforce or what, the executive order that I intend to pronounce if I'm governor on January 1st that arrogance ends in that agency and every other agency of state government. That we're all elected or appointed or hired as public servants to serve the people of Minnesota. You, the taxpayers, pay the checks of everybody who serves in state government. That doesn't mean we can't, we can satisfy everybody's interests all the time, but we can be respectful and we can listen, and that will be an absolute responsibility, and it's especially crucial for the Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, because you have all, a broad range of interests, and sometimes they do conflict with one another or compete with one another. And I want somebody who's going to listen, I want somebody who's going to enforce the listening and being respectful and being responsive mode all over. And I want somebody who's going to make that agency act on behalf of people. You know, I was up in Lutzen uh, recently and the resort owners there and the others, the small businesses depend on that whole industry. They're frustrated because the LCCMR appropriated funds about three and a half million dollars uh, almost four years ago for a trail there that they can use to make their, uh, especially their uh, fall and spring and summer seasons uh, more attractive for tourism, for the jobs, and uh, DNR you know, just sitting on the money. And they can't get a response. And they need a, a water uh, uh, waiver in terms of a river there for snowmaking so they can put, put the snow on the Lucent Mountains so they can provide more jobs in the wintertime. And DNR just sits on it and won't respond, and violates its own regulations and won't respond. And I want a commissioner who's going to tell people, you be a responsive, you have re deadlines, you are responsible to people of Minnesota, and, and you will act in, in the public interest. Uh, these are the people's resources, not yours. Very good. <coughs> Linda? I'm going to say team player and manager. Through my experience at the Capitol, I, I, I don't even know. Do they have executive committee meetings? Yes. Like, does the governor sit down with the head of each department? Yes. We Alone hope so. or together? Well, well we, if yeah. you're governor, you can sit we, down with We hope the governor is you. doing it right. Because when I talk to the commissioner of natural resources or when I talk to the MnDOT commissioner or the Minnesota EPA people, it's like nobody knows what each other's doing. And I would say, so, Mark, could you talk to this person or that person? You know, don't you guys? And my impression is they don't communicate a lot. So I'm going to say team player and manager because they all need to. It's not just a DNR issue when it's affecting different areas. They need to work together, those department heads. Um, and the other thing that I would help promote and that I've probably been responsible for some policy changes is I'm just going to say the CO's jobs are to not harass and intimidate, it should be educate and protect. And that is my message for, for Minda, or for the DNR commissioner. Mr. Rammer? I would, I would add, I would add with the educate and protect, it's to serve. It's, um, I, I think there's an attitude that has grown in government as it's gotten bigger, that government is there for our benefit and that you and I are supposed to be serving it. And that's what has to change. Uh, a commissioner, I'm not going to commit, obviously, I don't think anybody up here is going to commit to who they would uh, be interested in, but it's somebody who understands what the mission of the DNR is supposed to be. It's about protecting our natural resources. It's about making sure that we have all the recreational opportunities available, snowmobiling, ATV, hunting, fishing. Fishing, and it's about making sure that our, our lands are productive. We've talked about it today, making sure that we have habitat that is producing waterfowl that we can hunt, that is producing pheasants and grouse, that we can go out and experience the great tradition we have 
And then as somebody who's going to be a change agent, because that's what we're going to be about. It can no longer be about doing business as usual. It can't be about bringing some career bureaucrat who has been working inside a government all their, their life, who's going to just run things as they've been run before. You've got to not only set up a more uh, tight team, a, a tighter team, a smaller team, but you've got to set goals, Linda. You've got to have meetings and you've got to set goals in terms of how you are going to redesign the DNR to get all the excess and the unnecessary <laughs> functions out of it and get it back to doing the business of protecting our resources, making sure that we have the recre recreational opportunities that we expect in this state, which means access to land at a, at a reasonable cost, and then make sure that our lands are producing economically. Thank you. Mr. Horner. You know, these are great questions, but they're not nearly as complicated as the length of some of the answers would suggest. Let, let, let me just say quickly, I, I hope that politician, outdoors person, uh, resource manager, <laughs> aren't mutually exclusive terms. We need to find somebody who can serve all of those roles. Secondly, I think one of the, the things that Governor Ventura did very, very well is appoint what probably is the best cabinet Minnesota has ever had. You know, some, some gaps here and there, but overall, terrific cabinet. And it was a terrific cabinet because he appointed people not because he owed a debt to this interest group or because he was limited only to candidates from this political party or this narrow constituency. He appointed them because they were the best of the best, because they knew the issue, because they could work with other people, because they could build bridges to the legislature and to people like you because they came from folks like you. That's what we need to do. And that starts with the transition team. Look, the governor has about seven weeks by the time, between the time he is elected and the time that he has to, to produce the first budget. That's going to take a cabinet that is there, that hits the ground running, that understands what the needs are, and a, ca a transition team that, again, reflects the broad breadth of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dayton, we'll start with you, and then uh, um, some members of the Minnesota DFL party over the, over the years have not necessarily been very friendly to firearm owners in this state, um, and in addition, they've opposed some hunting seasons like dove hunting and uh, even the recently uh, introduced season for sandhill cranes. Uh, if you become governor, uh, how will your administration look at firearms, laws, rules, and hunting seasons like dove hunting? Well, I strongly support the Second Amendment. I have all my life. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I'm a hunter myself. I have uh, two loaded 357 Magnum pistols in my home right now in a lockbox. I have a 9 millimeter pistol uh, in home. I have a 12 gauge shotgun at home. So I'm a, a firearm owner myself. And uh, you know, since I'm a lawful, I have every right under the Constitution. And, and I will continue to s support those rights for every law abiding Minnesota citizen. I uh, support the continuation of the of hunting season and the crane season and you know work with the DNR in terms of uh, other seasons and I support absolutely completely the right of uh, the Minnesotans to hunt and fish and I supported the uh, Lazard amendment it proposed years ago that would establish the constitutional right of Minnesotans to hunt. Very good. I'm going to just say ditto except I don't have um, all those guns my husband and children do. <laughs> and I am a board member of our Ducks Unlimited committee which has has broken records for our fundraisers we've got the first DU ice fishing contest in garrison support uh, dove hunting hope that we move the season up a couple of weeks at least uh, support the sandhill crane hunting I, I don't know that any of my colleagues I don't know how many of you I have hunted sandhill crane and let me tell you they taste very good uh, what's that Oh, I'm sorry. Jackie says don't tell anybody. Uh, and then uh, I, I will just uh, say it very clearly. I, if, if governor, I would veto any legislation that re would restrict our citizens' rights to uh, hold and possess and own firearms. And that means any gun show legislation, anything like that, would be vetoed immediately. Oh. Oh, and one more, Ron, because you didn't add it. You talked about uh, doves. You talked about sandhill cranes. I think it's time that we have a governor who, and Linda, you talked about it. It, it is a federal issue, but we've got to be willing to fight for what we need here in Minnesota and get our congressional delegation, get our uh, federal representatives to help us get the law changed. And another area that's got to be changed is with wolves. 
We have got to get lo wolves delisted, and we've got to have a season on wolves in this state. We have too many wolves, and it's causing major problems. <laughs> I don't think they taste as good as Sandhill Crane, though. Look, I, I, you know, I think we all agree on the, the importance of the, the Second Amendment, and we probably wouldn't be here if we didn't agree with that, so I think we're all in accord there. On, on the seasons, absolutely support them. I think even the commissioner would agree that maybe on the Sandhill Cranes, he could have had a little more um, uh, involvement by the public, a little more discussion, not because the, the hunting season is in any way contradictory to good uh, management, but because I think that's the way to buy people into understanding the value of these seasons, to understand why we have these kinds of seasons, and again, you know, help educate people. A real quick follow-up on the wolf issue. We've been spending a lot, I joke at Outdoor News, it seems like a half a dozen times we've reported that wolves have been de delisted in Minnesota, and then they get relisted. Does, does everyone agree with Representative uh, Emmer here that we need to do whatever we can as governor to accelerate that process? Uh, Senator Dayton, I'll let yeah, you they should first. be delisted, and the DNR should have the management authority. And you know, I mean, uh, one of my good friends in Ely, uh, Will Steger, had you know two uh, dogs his, uh, eaten right out from underneath his cabin when he was gone for a weekend by wolves. And as he said, you know, the real danger is uh, you know wolves have lost their fear of, of the human race. And uh, you know, I, I, I worry seriously that we're going to in, in danger uh, our children up in those areas as well as certainly livestock. And a lot of the ranchers up there, understandably, you know, find their livestock eviscerated. And uh, you know, I have a friend who's dog was out for a walk with a German Shepherd. I own two German Shepherds, uh, and so I'm very sensitive to this. And, you know, this female wolf on the other side is up in Cherry, Minnesota, was across and, you know, doing a little dance, and the dog took off. And, you know, she was the decoy, and this pack uh, came and eviscerated the dog. So we've got a serious uh, encroachment problem here, and the DNR needs to be responsible for giving the authority to manage this so we protect our, our livestock and protect our domestic animals and protect our children. Mr. Horner, you want to chime in on this real quick? Or? Sure. I mean, the answer is yes, we ought to delist, and I don't know that much more needs to be said. Okay. All right. Good enough. Uh, one more quick federal issue. It may not be quick, but we'll, we'll again, brevity, folks, so we'll make that our friend. Federal farm legislation that expires in 2012 uh, contains a lot of programs important to sportsmen, uh, CRP, uh, the Conservation Reserve Program, WRP. Uh, there's open fields in there. Uh, it's unclear how Congress is going to address the Farm Bill, given the dire federal budget situation we're in. As governor, uh, are you folks still going to push hard to uh, make sure that, uh, uh, that these federal programs continue? Real important uh, conservation programs, especially in, in western Minnesota. We'll start back on that end uh, with you, Mr. It, it, absolutely. I think that's one of the great opportunities that Minnesota has, is to work with our federal delegation, some of whom are leaders on, on this area, to make sure that we are getting farm programs that protect our, our uh, natural heritage, that protect our, our lands, our habitats, and, and the water quality. You know, you mentioned CRP. Going back to the, the original question around water quality, that's a key tool in making sure that we're able to, to provide the easements along drainage ditches, along some of our waterways and, and shorelines, to protect the quality of water. So absolutely, we have to make an investment in that. Now, I would hope that we're also, at the same time, working with the, the federal delegation to make sure that we have a responsible farm bill coming out. Because again, we do have to make sure that we are reining in government at the federal level as well as at the state level. So where I disagree, uh, uh, one of the areas I disagree with, with Representative Emmer is that I do think that we need smart government because the alternative is dumb government, and dumb government is when we spend without any sense of what are we getting. When we start with the process instead of the outcome, Outcomes. We need to have good outcomes and then figure out how we get there and get there collectively and get there in partnership. Let me just add one, one point. An example of dumb government, and, and it's been perpetuated by the, the legislature, is in some counties, 40% of your property tax dollars, if your county property tax dollars, is going to pay for unfunded mandates from the state. That's dumb government. You know, we need to trust county officials to say, you've got an election certificate, you're smart people, we can build a partnership with you to help manage these resources and to help manage our resources, our economic resources appropriately. All right, very good. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions now from the audience. Here's one. Um, so as all of you have been stressing the need for efficiency in state government, uh, what efficient uh, what efficiency specifically would you propose and I'm going to start with uh, representative Emmer because the part of the question is directed at you 
Representative Emmer, how do you expect to increase productivity of our lands when you would cut the DNR budget by 20 percent? I don't know if that figure is correct or not, but the, the uh, uh, person writing the question thought so. So let's start with you about increasing efficiency of DNR and uh, cutting budgets. Well, first off, I love it that people, and I'm, I'm going to assume that that's somebody who's here who's having a little fun with the, uh, with the numbers, because you've got to go back and read the actual transcript of what I said, because uh, Senator Dayton has proposed a, uh, this uh, tax the rich scheme that he's been told doesn't work. It's uh, wishful thinking. But if you look at his numbers, over a four-year period, based on what he's proposed, he's cutting government by 20 percent over a four-year period. So I don't know if you were directing that at me or at uh, the center. Here's what I've been saying from day one. We have too much government. We have too many agencies that are given the authority for the same area of supervision, given the authority to promote rules to affect the same areas they overlap, and then they're all competing not only for the regulatory uh, authority, uh, but also for the, the fees and the fines that they're generating out of it. That's wrong. That's where government has turned around and started working against you and me. It's got to work for us. So when I talk about efficiencies, I'm talking about making sure that we don't have five state agencies that you got to go through to permit for water. Right now, folks, just at a horizontal level in the government, the state government, you got to go to the Department of Agriculture, you got to go to the Department of Health, you got to go to the Board of Water and Soil Resources, you've got to go to the MPCA, and then uh, you've got to go, which one did I leave out? The DNR. I left out the one that we're talking about. Uh, you've got to go to, like that, that's a swigum, by the way. I've got five state agencies, five state agencies. There's four. Uh, five state agencies. It's okay. You guys can smile. I'm just Steve, having a little Steve's fun. He's talking about, right? I'm having a little fun. Here's, here's the, uh, the issue is this. It's called making sure that government is efficient, that you don't have people duplicating services. That's what we're talking about. And then the big discussion, if you want to drive the things that sportsmen want, You've got to make sure that we've got a private economy that's growing. You know, hopefully we're going to get a question that's really substantive about lead. I'd like to hear how, what these other people think about this attempt to ban lead. Because we should not be banning lead. We should base our decisions on, with intelligent people, by the way, not smart government, on facts. And the fact is lead has not declined, a cause to decline in any species out there, and yet there's this movement across the country by the Humane Society and others to eliminate lead. And you know what? I'm worried about not only the, the uh, fact that there is no scientific proof that it affects us in a negative manner, but also the 1,400 jobs at Federal Cartridge up in uh, Anoka or all the jobs around the state of people that are making fishing tackle that would be affected by this irresponsible and foolish uh, legislation. That's what you got to do. Government efficiencies, Tom. Yeah, you, you, you know, I uh, or DNR efficiencies. Uh, uh, well, I always love to to try to follow Representative Emmer's kind of circuitous path here to start here and somehow end over here. I mean, absolutely, we need greater efficiency, but it also is greater cooperation. We need to redefine the role between the state, the relationship between the state government and local governments. As I said, I mean, when you have in some counties 40 percent of your property taxes going to pay for unfunded mandates, and the legislature over the last six years has done nothing but add to those unfunded mandates, that's the lack of efficiency. That's what cause, causes local governments to have to raise property taxes. It is what causes the state government to add bureaucracy because now we at the state level have to try to manage that. You know, you're, you're, you're not going to create greater efficiency just by cutting a few uh, department heads or by merging a couple of programs. That's not how you get it. You get it by starting off with what kind of a state do we want to be? What are the outcomes we need to achieve? And then what's the best way to get there? Not the best state government way to get there, but the best way to get there. And sometimes it's going to be local government, sometimes it's going to be county government, and sometimes it's going to be state government. And we've got to be smart enough to figure out how to do that. And we also have to be trusting enough to say, look, you're not electing a governor who ought to be chairman of 87 county commissions, superintendent of 330 school districts, or mayor of 1,800 towns and townships. You're electing a governor who ought to set a strategy, a vision, clear principles, and then lead the state to figure out what are the outcomes that we want to be. And ultimately, I think that's the issue in this election. Who has the vision? 
who has the temperament, who has the ability to bring people together to create the outcomes and achieve the outcomes that we want for a prosperous, healthy, productive Minnesota. Mr. Date. I agree with Representative Emmer that the duplication, triplication of uh, jurisdictions, reporting requirements, one of the, the plagues of, on people, whether it's individuals, whether it's nonprofits, whether it's small business owners, whether it's local government school districts affected by state and federal regulations. And you know, when I ran for governor 12 years ago, I proposed the second session, the even-eared session, be what I call the unsession. Rather than adding things, the legislature would focus, along with agency heads, solely on uh, reducing and eliminating these duplications and triplications and making s government more efficient, more responsive, setting deadlines, requiring agencies to s follow those deadlines. And uh, I will not wait till the second year. I will say the first two months of the legislative session where a, a lot of time, frankly, is just spent uh, just uh, taking the advantage of the fact it's a long session. I want them to focus with my agency heads and, and concerned citizens and small business and other organizations who are uh, f afflicted by these and say, how can we reduce, how can we streamline, how can we make more responsive, and, and DNR would certainly be one of those agencies. Linda, and add to that. I would say the DNR's got a lot of power because a lot of their decisions don't even have to go through the legislature. Um, there, right now, the astronomical amount of funds being spent on, whether it's Mille Lacs Lake, Red Lake, the treaty management, it, it is millions of wasteful dollars. Right now at the University of Minnesota, there are people studying red-tailed snails and blue-spotted frogs because they've got the money from the lottery. You know, we need to manage from the top and start cutting out. Take, look at the money you have, how about, and then go from there. Do a budget. Very and good. By the way, I had a comment here. Uh, uh, Mr. Emerson, since you brought up lead, uh, somebody in the audience said, uh, and I don't know if you were talking about lead paint, but he said, I have lead and benzene poisoning. It's no fun. I'm a painter. So I was talking about lead shot. Yeah, I, I was that. talking about lead uh, angling equipment and that type of stuff. Okay, Rob? Which I think these people know. Let's uh, start on, on this. And, and I'm, I'm hoping maybe we can get a quick yes or no uh, from all you folks on this question. Senator Dayton, we had a battle over definitions in the legislature the past couple of years over the legacy amendment, the, the definitions uh, of, of what, what that money was supposed to be spent on. Uh, it, it took a lot, of, a lot of work, but uh, Margaret Anderson, Kelleher, and the Democrats kind of finally came around on this and just reinstated the original language. Can, can the four of you, and I'm going to start with you because it was your party that kind of had this in limbo for a while. Can you assure us that if, if any bill comes along that would rewrite those definitions on how the legacy amendment dollars are to be spent on conservation, that you will veto it? Yes, I'll veto it. It's going down the line. Linda, what do you say? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Look, that wasn't a policy battle. That was a political battle, and yes, I would veto it. Well, just wanted to get you on record. <laughs> okay. uh, we still have some pads of paper here. We've got a little time left. We'd be happy to take some more questions uh, if, if folks have anything else. And, I, Ron, should we go with our plan to give the candidates an opportunity to? We can do that. We can go a little longer if you want to. If, we, if, if folks are want to hang on a little while longer, we would like maybe close. Uh, Ron's got another question. But maybe we want to get the candidates an opportunity to ask one question to one other candidate. So if you want to ponder that. As we, uh, as we continue here. All right, I'm going to talk about the uh, walk-in access program idea that's been floating around Minnesota for a long, long time. Uh, DNR a few years ago said they were going to study it for uh, three years, and I said I won't be able to walk by that time. And that was uh, five years before that. So, um, and then others will say uh, they don't know if that would uh, work here in Minnesota. But nevertheless, a lot of people think uh, walk-in program, access program is valuable. Would you as governor support the critical walk-in access program? Um, let's start with uh, Tom at the other end there. Yes. Okay. Yes, and I think our DNR right now is working with farmers, especially in southwestern Minnesota, Ron, and hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're going to hear something. Very good. Linda? Yes. Okay. Yes, I support it. Let's go on the record. Those are probably the shortest answers in the history of the uh, candidate debates, huh? Rob? Let's go back to one last personnel question, and I'm, then I'm going to ask you folks to, to ask questions of each other. And that's the Lassard Outdoor Heritage Council. The next governor will, I believe, in January or February of next year, be able to appoint two people to that council, and then two more in 2013. Uh, can you tell us the type of people you choose? Uh, what priorities for the council would you cite when choosing members? Will they be public land advocates? Senator Dayton, why don't we start on this end? 
Well, I've been a friend of Bob Lazard for 30 years, and I will support uh, Bob Lazard type people who uh, understand the importance of those resources, who have supported that amendment, who uh, would be advocates to, for the words uh, that are written and passed by the people of Minnesota, and who represent all parts of the state. As I said earlier, when the, the northernmost person on the board uh, council right now is in Purim, which is about 182 miles uh, from the Canadian border. Uh, clearly, that northern part of Minnesota has just been denied representation, and that's just fundamentally wrong. Your team player, go back to that, just, and good manager. I'd be working with sportsmen's groups directly, uh, Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, you name it, and make sure that the people that are appointed to the Lassard Council are, are interested in producing productive land for hunting and fishing. That, that would be the key. Not for dog parks in Minneapolis. I'm sorry if I offend you. <laughs> for the original intent, the money was intended. I believe that you bring the same principles to appointing members of the commission, that you bring to appointing other members of, of the administration, that you bring to all of the critical appointments that a governor has to make. And that is you want people who represent a broad range of Minnesota, who are tied to um, enforcing and, and pursuing the policies as laid out in law, not their own um, narrow interpretation of the law, and you know, frankly, who are smarter than I am. And I think you go to groups like you to say, give me some recommendations and let's see what makes sense. We got all four of us there? Uh, are we all done? Yeah. OK. I'm sorry. I'm ready to read some questions. Here, here we go. Um, we have a duck problem in Minnesota. I assume that four of you have heard about that. There is also a duck recovery plan in the works. Um, but we talked earlier about land acquisition. Some of you were very cautious about land acquisition, mentioning the far north where there is so much state and federal land. But outside of the far north, about 50 of the 87 counties, and this is a question from the audience, 50 of the 87 counties have but 2% of the total area of those counties in waterfowl management areas. Uh, how? Do you, what are your views on uh, acquiring wetlands in the southern part of the state under the duck recovery plan? Mr. Dayton? Well, uh, that goes again to what I said before about not imposing a you know, one-size-fits-all uh, through legislation. So, you know, yes, the counties are very different. I, as I said earlier, used to duck and uh, hunt down in southwestern Minnesota down by Wyndham. And, you know, the, absolutely, we want to provide access. That's why the walk-in program is important to provide access as well. So I, I will certainly support those efforts to provide access. And we also need to be responsible to counties. And uh, be, you know, if we're taking away, of, uh, uh, we, or if we're acquiring uh, land for public use, then there needs to be a you know, payment in lieu of taxes kind of provision so that uh, property taxes don't go up for people who live in that county. Linda? I don't have any specific answer for that. Mr. Hammer? Uh, it, it goes back, Ron, to what I talked about earlier. That's why you have to have a strategic land acquisition uh, plan. You have to, it, we can't uh, just buy land because it's available. We've got to make sure that we have a plan as to why we're doing it. You know, one of the problems that I have or one of the issues that I see with uh, WMAs is when we're doing the right thing, we think we're doing the right thing, and we, uh, ac we acquire lands that all of a sudden, because of the activity around them, the restrictions uh, on the lands around them literally uh, preclude people from accessing that land for hunting. That's a problem. We've got to make sure that we have a plan, that we know what we're doing in all 87 counties. And then we've got to empower people at the local level to make sure those work and make sure they're productive for hunting and fishing. Well, we're talking about hunting right now. Mr. Hunter. I believe, again, we start with outcomes. What is it that we want to achieve? And what we want to achieve in specific response to your question are the habitats that are going to be productive for, for wildlife and, and in the, the question you asked, particularly for, for ducks and waterfowl. We start by acquiring the land that is needed, not just the land that is available, in a strategic management plan, not just a strategic acquisition plan, but a strategic management plan. We also incorporate in that plan 
how are we going to reimburse the local governments fairly and so that they're partners in all of this. And thirdly, we look at how private management, uh, the, the management of habitat on private land complements the, the public land acquisition so that we have an overall comprehensive approach to habitat management and development. All right, very good. Just one follow-up from the audience here uh, says, uh, uh, sort of directed that uh, Mr. Amherst said this, uh, this person says, the city of Minneapolis has received no dedicated funding for dog parks, although uh, Mr. Amherst keeps saying that. Can he clarify if he really thinks they actually received constitutional money for dog parks? No, Ron, and whoever asked the question, but this was a discussion uh, at the legislature, which is why I keep bringing it up. This is why it's so important to make sure that you have a governor who is not only a friend of sportsmen, who is an actual sportsman, who has boots on the ground, who actually is experiencing this, so you know when you talk to the groups who it is you are putting on the Lassard Sam's Council so that they will absolutely honor the original intent that that money was intended for. I'm going to start on the other end. Asian carp, Mr. Horner, how do we keep them out of Minnesota? I think that we'd be more aggressive in doing some of the things that we're kind of, that we're already doing, working downstream, making sure that we're putting up the barriers well before that they uh, get into the Minnesota waterways. We'll, we'll just work our way down, Mr. Uh, That's about Mark. education. It's going to take all the people in this tent. It's going to take the people in Minnesota to be vigilant on all these issues, whether it's Asian carp or it's uh, any invasive species we're talking about. They're coming, and we just have to be uh, constantly vigilant and educating our citizens as to what you need to do to stop the spread. Linda, any ideas? And then just maybe think ahead to the future of how you're going to manage it, because really it is inevitable. Right. Every aggressive preventive measure possible, Asian carp, the zebra mussels, you know, I mean, whether it's coming into the Port of Duluth or from, from uh, wherever it's coming in, up the, the rivers now, elsewhere, uh, working with the federal government, working with other states, uh, every possible preventative and then control measure. Should we... Uh, Skip to the uh, the question. Do you, does, I don't know, again, I guess we'll maybe start on that end with Mr. Horner since uh, uh, Senator Dayton quit. We're going to let each of you ask a question to another uh, to another candidate. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Horner. Well, I guess my question to whichever of the the candidate wants to to address is. We've talked about a whole range of important issues, a whole range of some of the roles for the private sector, for the public sector, for state government, local government, but particularly the, the two principal candidates, with all due respect to, to Linda, uh, Representative Emmerich, Senator Dayton, both of you have made proposals that really come down to you're going to try to do all of this with one hand tied behind your back. Representative Emmer going to do it only through spending cuts. Senator Dayton do it only through tax increases. How do we do accomplish all of the things that you've laid out, many of the things that we agree on, with one hand tied behind your back? Who would like to be first? Well, I'd say most of what we've talked about today in terms of, uh, you know, much of what we talked about today in terms of DNR, in terms of what we just talked about preventing the invasion of, of, of uh, invasive species, of what we talked about in terms of resource management, uh, public acquisition and the like, involves a commitment of public resources. And I've talked about specifically how to raise the, those revenues, Mr. Horner, uh, by making the richest Minnesotans, people, individuals uh, with uh, income over $150,000 and uh, f joint filers with income of uh, almost $175,000 pay a little more in taxes than millionaires paying more in taxes, which uh, you said, uh, less than Almanac, you're opposed. The millionaires paying more in taxes in this state. And uh, you're in instead in favor of, you know, extending the sales tax to clothing, extremely regressive. I noticed that also in response to Almanac, you're in favor of uh, raising taxes on, on alcohol and cigarettes, another regressive tax. So the difference between us is I want to raise taxes on the rich, and you want to raise taxes on sportsmen and women and, and middle-income working families. Mr. Emmer, do you want to answer that? Sure. First off, uh, Senator Dayton, I don't know that uh, when you talk about raising uh, taxes on the wealthiest Minnesotans, that people that are making $130,000 or $150,000 combined, you know, that's a good living, but those that, are middle class, class folks. Tax those are dollars. middle class folks, and you are going right after the mom and pop businesses in this state. That is the wrong answer at the wrong time, and frankly, that's politics as usual we've been doing around this state for decades. It hasn't worked, and it's not going to work in the future. And this is the problem, folks. It's time for people from outside of government to get into these jobs. When you have made your living on government, or you have constantly be, been running for office and, and working in government your entire life, you have this concept that when people talk about real reform, it means cutting. 
I got news for you. Revenues are going up. We are in a very difficult time, absolutely. But it's funny how government revenues keep going up, and these guys keep talking about cutting. It's time to talk about looking at government rather than going straight to the pocketbooks of the hard-working men and women and the businesses of this state every time government, which is not working, runs out of money and tell them we need more from you. It's time that we look at government, redesign that so it's efficient, it delivers the services that people expect, set your priorities and honor those priorities, and then let's let people of the state of Minnesota start to create their own opportunities. Let's get this attitude from people who have made their life in government, that government's the only thing that can create opportunities. Let's get back to understanding that it was not government that built this state or this country, it was people. And it's people that are gonna fix it. Okay. All right, um, let's, uh, why don't, we, uh, why don't we skip to Linda. Linda, do you have a question for one of the candidates? And then we'll, we'll go back to Representative Ember. Do you have a question? You're going to pass. That's fine. All right. Then I'll go back to Representative Ember. Do you have a question for one of the candidates? And I, I will ask you to keep the question short and sweet and the response short and I sweet. do. I do. Uh, Senator Dayton, you talk about deathbed conversions. I've explained why I do the things I do. Uh, if you could just explain to me and everybody else here in the state of Minnesota, how is it that you can have an F rating from the NRA and you can sit up here and tell us that you're going to defend sportsmen's rights, you're going to defend my right and my children's right to hunt and fish in this state when you've got an F from the NRA? Have you had one of your own uh, deathbed conversion? Well, we won't call it deathbed, but one of your own conversions that you're sharing with us today? No, I had an A rating from the NRA in 1982 and I ran to the Senate. I had two A rating in 2000 and there are two principal votes, you can look them up, uh, is when I was a senator. One was uh, banning cop killer bullets. And uh, one of the reasons I have the endorsement of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association representative is because I respect the law enforcement men and women. I was on a ride along last week. To, I've been on several times with a police officer in St. Paul. You know, those guys wear uh, bulletproof vests every time they go out there, men and women. And anybody who wants to go out there and see them put their lives on the line to protect us, and when the police chiefs and the police officers of this state and this nation come to us and say, those bullets are made to kill us, then yeah, I'll vote to ban them. Does that prevent a law-abiding hunter or fishing, a hunter in this state from, from going out and, and hunting and fishing? Absolutely not. How many of you, how many of you own cop-killer bullets and use them against police officers? Raise your hand. How many of you ever fired a cop-killer bullet against a police officer in this state? Raise your hand. Nobody's representative ever. Nobody. Nobody. And they shouldn't ever happen. And I'm going to a service, I'm sure you are too, sir, next week for a sheriff, deputy sheriff. This state gave his life. The Maplewood police officer gave his life. Men and women who die. And their children and their wives suffer for the rest of their lives. And if I can prevent one police officer in this state from dying through a cop killer bullet, I will do so as governor of this state. And I will at the same time support the right of every law abiding Minnesotan to bear arms, to possess firearms as I do, to use those for lawful purposes. And to insinuate otherwise is just, just untrue. Okay, uh, Linda, do you have a question? Thank you. I just want to ask if um, the other candidates support the Castle Doctrine. I'd be honest, I don't know what it is. I have. Can you fill us in, Linda, real quick? It's the uh, um, ability to protect yourself in your home. Oh, absolutely. You, you, well, home. it gets written in different ways. I'm sorry, Senator yep. Dayton, were you? Were you no, right? I said, okay. I, I, I mean, the right of a yeah. person to protect themselves in their home? Oh, absolutely, I support that. But, but let's be careful, because as you know, Linda, it gets defined in different ways, and so let's make sure that we're doing the, the, the right castle doctrine um, where, where it is about protecting a home. And then finally, I think, Senator Dayton, it's your opportunity to ask a question. You know, in the interest of brevity and congeniality, I, I don't have any questions. You're going to pass. It's been a great discussion. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate very much being a part of it. And I'm going to be at my booth the rest of the next couple hours. Uh, welcome anybody's uh, continuing questions. Are you going to handle any more of these questions that have come from the audience? Well, we've gone through quite a few of them. We've gone through quite a few, Bob. Which one uh, were you thinking of, Bob? Well, I, I do, we, okay, we've got one from Bob. We, in, the, in the interest of... Of Rather moving on, we were going to stop. Yeah. Should, should I? Should we? Yeah, let's. We have to. We're going to need. Mr. We need Dayton to. has to leave, and let's give a nice hand to our panelists here. Thank you very much.
Thank you for hanging in here so long, folks.